You are here today to hear a panel discussion by an illustrious group of contemporary Los Angeles graffiti artists. The artists on the panel will share their unique experiences and the evolution of their work toward becoming a lasting tradition. The panel will be curated by, was curated by Man One and Scott Sourdough Power, founder of Cruise Studio and host of the Not Real Art Podcast. And will feature graffiti artists Chaz Bojorquez, Petal, Aceborn, and Zoo. Following the panel discussion, there will be a book signing of Man One's first picture book, Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix, which is currently receiving national awards and accolades for its colorful and original illustrated work. Please join me in welcoming everyone to the stage. All right, people showed up. Cool. So welcome, thank you for, for coming to our event um, and this panel that we're about to have a really good, uh, hopefully lively conversation. Um, again, I'm Man One and my partner over there. Hello everybody, I'm Sourdough. And um, we're gonna try to kind of conduct it more of a conversation than anything else. Um, but, um, you know, I just wanted to make sure that, that we had um, graffiti artists from different generations, different backgrounds, um, and obviously different gender. So, um, diversity, diversity, yes, this diversity on diversity. So we're hoping to, uh, you know, feel some questions at the end of the talk. Um, but for now we'll, we'll get started. Maybe Scott, you want to see me? Sure. Uh, thanks man. Uh, I want to say how grateful I am to the LA public library for this panel. This is great. And to be a part of this is an honor. Um, man one and I co-host a podcast together called not real art. And uh, it's a lot of fun, at least we think so, um, as the name might imply. Um, we call it Not Real Art because our favorite artists are always the ones pushing the envelope that are oftentimes told by the gatekeepers and the intelligentsia, yeah, that's not real art. Um, well, who's to say, right? Um, and so one of the great things about this panel is that these are amazing artists right here who are constantly pushing the envelope and innovating. And so I'm excited to get started. So we're just going to go right down the line that, at beginning and um, I just want to introduce um, Chaz Bohorquez and um, let him tell you a little bit about how he got started and you know how long ago he's been doing this and stuff like that. Ready? Okay. Thanks. I also want to thank the Public Library for in, uh, making this opportunity to have us speak about graffiti. All right. It was a time that it, we weren't able to but uh, and it looks like a Great crowd. Thank you all for showing up also, on a, especially on a beautiful day and with all that traffic out there, you know. Uh, I'm Chaz Bojorquez from Highland Park. I did, I uh, went to Franklin, Burbank. I'm all from, from LA, you know, and I was born in Chinatown. I did my first graffiti in 1969. So I'm one of the originators of the graffiti movement. And in back east, they started in 67 and 69, but they stopped right away, so I'm the longest writer in the world, you know. And also, meeting the other writers, I'm also the oldest, <laughs> longest writing writer in the world. So, but uh, my style is the uh, West Coast Cholo gang style. Not that New York bubble letters and all that multicolors, uh, upper and lower case where they write about themselves. It's kind of like a, a, a me mentality over there. They just write uh, just the, the name, they don't write about their culture or anything. We're over here, we write the roll call. We write about the us. It's a different aspect about over here in the West Coast. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll go over to, um, I'm just showing some images in the back. They're, you know, We'll go through them. So um, we're not gonna really talk about each one, but I just wanna show you guys, if you're not familiar with some of these artists, <laughs> which I hope you are. But uh, let's go next uh, to Petal. Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, my name's Petal, and I am a Los Angeles graffiti artist. I've been writing since the early 90s, and um, I got into graffiti during kind of, I would say, probably the biggest graffiti explosion of Los Angeles. So for my generation, it's really like a rite of passage. I think almost everybody in junior high, you know, tagged a few times at least. And so um, for those of us that stuck with it, you know, we 
we came upon this like huge cultural movement, subculture of Los Angeles, and it was kind of blended with um, a lot of different street cultures from, you know, gangbanging to skating, like this whole world that we were navigating. And so graffiti was like a positive artistic outlet. And it was one of the roads that I think that a lot of people that I, you know, grew up with in, in uh, you know, mostly in throughout the whole entire city, but I'm mostly from the west side of LA. Um, I think that, you know, we just gravitated towards it naturally. And, um, and I just happened to stick with it. And I did a lot of illegal graffiti as a youth. And um, from getting in trouble so many times, I kind of wanted to continue to do it, but not have to um, get in trouble so much and get arrested. So I got into muralism through a lot of artists like Man One, older generation, like, you know, like one kind of big brother generation of mine. And Man actually put me in my first art show. And so um, it was graffiti artists who were older than me that kind of introduced me to these other pathways of, of utilizing graffiti. And we all thought it would, you know, evolve and explode on this worldwide level. Like we felt it would, but we had no idea. And now here we are. So. Awesome. Uh, hello, uh, I'm Ace. Uh, I grew up in Inglewood and South Central. Um, uh, it's, I guess for me, sitting on this stage, I'm sort of uh, like the future generation of everything. Um, for me, growing up, my background, uh, I came from the foster system. So I grew up seeing a lot of this artwork on the street and I gravitated towards it. You know, I grew up with comic books and seeing like, all these different cool cartoons on TV and stuff. And what I saw on the street just sort of caught my attention. I think I took the time to just sort of dabble in it. And it just kept drawing me in more and more. And the more I learned about it, the more I got into it. Um, and then over the course of time, my style sort of started to shift. I started to think about things in a more academic way. And how could I still sort of utilize what it is I'm so ad adapted to within this growing art that I'm sort of, you know, trying to figure out as I go along. Uh, my name is Eric Zoo Scottness. I'm from Northeast Los Angeles. I started writing graffiti when I was about 11. Um, slowly, I guess I slowly started going into more murals and large scale work and eventually led me into illustration and to pursue college at Art Center when I was about 26. And that kind of opened the door for more of a, studying more of a classical figurative style. And then I kind of retreated from graffiti for a while. But as soon as I was done with school, I try to blend the two styles together. And uh, that's where I'm at right now, just trying to travel and do large scale murals with that style. Cool, thank you. So um, now that we all know a little bit about what you guys are up to, um, you know, one of the things that I, I just kind of hadn't really thought about till we're here is that I've had the experience of working with you guys personally uh, through my gallery, Crew West, um, also um, on different uh, events, um, art projects. Is everyone on here on the Getty book? Did, did, who, you, you were in that? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So one of the things I wanted to talk about is just how, um, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't, I didn't see graffiti in a lot of venues or um, I knew it could be in all kinds of places. Um, people always talk about graffiti being ephemeral. Uh, you know, you, you should be used to having it being destroyed or taken away. But I never saw it that way. So my question to you guys is, did you guys, because um, now some of your work is collected, some of your murals are permanent, some of your artworks in collections in big museums, um, was there a shift when it happened from when graffiti was just something that you did on the weekend just for fun that was going to get gone over to all of a sudden now it's like serious stuff? Like when did that transition happen for each of you? Uh, it was different for me because that took about 30 years. You know, it's almost not funny. <laughs> you know? uh, in 69, in the 70s, there was no uh, audience for graffiti. Uh, there was no galleries, there was no magazines, no books. This was before the computers. And there were no collectors, there was no dialogue about graffiti. The only graffiti out in the LA was the gang, 
cholo style. Donnie Cruz were gangsters. That was it. So, but I fell in love with the letters. I always seen them throughout my entire life. Uh, my uncle was a zoot suitor. Uh, my father was a kind of like, um, I always describe him, he thought he was Frank Sinatra. He, he, we come from Tijuana, and uh, my grandfather was a head engineer of the uh, Hip Hippodromo racetrack. So there was always a lot of gambling. There was always a lot of drinking in my family. Uh, there was all like that madman. Those little kids where they, everybody had, uh, we were those kids. Yeah. All the parents drank and all that in big parties. And uh, so I would see my cousins going into prison and then I would see the graffiti in Highland Park. And then as a young kid, I would go down into the uh, sewer lines and into the um, drainage, the uh, um, drainage tubes that come down to the river from the street. And I would find graffiti back there from 1940s and 1950s and found it fascinating, all done with smoke, with candles, Zippo lighters. And I wanted to know what were they saying and I wanted to be like them when I grew up. So in the 70s and the 80s, I did it by myself. I had friends, and uh, they wouldn't last. I ended up just going to the river all by myself and started tagging. Then I started meeting these older cholos, and I said, I need to know what graffiti is about because it is a language. It has grammar, it has structure, it has punctuation. I go, if I could learn how to use this as my own toolkit, I could create my own artwork and make it my own language. I could, I could have it as a voice. So that took... 10 years or so. And at the same time, I was trying to find my Chicano identity. I went to uh, galleries in East LA and they were saying, hey, look, you know, I got some of this graffiti, you know, I call it artwork. They go, it's anti-Chicano, we're not gonna show that. They go, because Chicanoism is uh, family religions, border, says our Chavez, uh, you know, uh, everything they were trying to do, promote in the 70s with the Chicano graffiti was against it or they felt it would undermine everything they were doing. I ended up in Hollywood and who gave me the green light, who embraced me at the Zero One Gallery was Big Daddy Roth and Robert Williams, the uh, cartoonist, you know, who started uh, Juxtapose Magazine and Big Daddy Roth was the, uh, the car uh, hot rod designer of the, uh, of the 50s and the 60s. They embraced my work. They said, we don't know what it means, Chaz, but it's bad boy because they were all hot riders and all that. So it took a while. And then late 80s, I started meeting people like Man One, and he was turning like 17, you know. And they were kids. And I was turning 40. And I told them, I go, hey, you know, all this vandalism you guys are doing is going to work against you. Ah, oh, Chaz, you're messed up. It's all about action, about vandalism. It's all about etching. It's all that scribing and all that stuff. And what they were doing was real graffiti. What I had been doing, I had trying to find what graffiti was about. And I found that the audience were these kids. And I was 20 years older than them. I, uh, they asked me to, sh to start showing with them. And I had my professional people tell me, hey, you start showing, showing with kids, your career is over and all that because you are a painter and all that because there was no graffiti art at that time. But in showing with Man One and some of these younger kids at that time in the early 90s, 89 and 90, uh, once we started talking about graffiti, uh, there was no age limit. I eventually knew had connections. I helped organize some of the first graffiti shows. I didn't do the first ones. There were other people who did that, I get credit. But together, we started building the graffiti movement in the West Coast style. I couldn't have done it myself unless with the youth. And the youth had me to break ice, you know, talk to the police, all that, go to the courts you know, for uh, character referencing, uh, you know, try to, try to get places, uh, get free paint and all that. I did everything I could to support the movement in the West Coast. And it was who took over were people like Man One once they were in their 30s, I guess, you know. Well, one of the things I want to say is, you know, that's a good point you brought up. Um, Back then, a lot of the real Chicano artists, they weren't helping us out. They weren't going to give us a, a hand up. There was very few of them who actually helped, uh, helped us produce murals or gave us uh, a show or, or an opportunity. Um, you know, I, I remember having a, 
having been able to show at Frank Romero's studio one time. I remember Ernesto de la, de, la, de, la, de la Losa inviting us to paint a wall one time, but that was pretty much it. And what was different about you is that you allowed us to come into some of the venues that we couldn't even knock on the doors, you know? And so, um, you know, first of all, thank you for that. But, you know, the thing was that when these people were, not, were calling you that you were not a Chicano artist, you know, where were the Chicanos supporting the Chicanos? This kind of, you know, I always saw what we were doing as the next generation of Chicano art, you know? I wasn't, ex I wasn't, uh, I was rejected as a Chicano artist because there was, like I say, negative. How can you deny Cholo graffiti West Coast not being Chicano? I mean, you know, give me a break. You know, some. But, is it, but isn't that a classic kind of situation where you have sort of a, uh, an established norm and you know something new comes up and it's and it's kind of disrupting and it's and it's innovating and the kind of the, the folks that are kind of running it are like no 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 you know we can't do that because it's not you know the normal thing or the conventional thing feels like that's kind of a classic challenge for artists no yeah i think that that's absolutely a classic challenge going all the way back to like you know, the Impressionists and different people from the Renaissance time. Um, for me particularly, or in my experience, um, I saw, I was at those early shows. I was at Chaz's early shows with like Mir and different artists on Melrose at Zero One Gallery. And it was really groundbreaking to see this work in a, in a gallery setting and see graffiti art, especially to see both of them really, to see Mir's work in a gallery setting because he was such a prolific like illustrator and artist and, and, and there wasn't really doors open like that even for artists from like Hollywood. And then to see Chaz's work with like the, the really LA gangster writing styles and really how like the, that kind of, it, it really opened the door or paved the way for looking at gang writing as art. And it really is magnificent calligraphy. You know, it's like when you, when you look at gang styles, which is what influenced most of us taggers in Los Angeles, just seeing this like, kind of like all these different fonts on the walls, just you wanted to learn how to do it. So everybody would just kind of copy it and copy the cursive and copy the gang block styles and and it was just something that I think everyone who saw that did. But seeing it in a gallery did kind of change um, my perspective as a young, really young person. I was like a teenager going to these shows. And, um, and also, I do recognize that in terms of like that the Chicano artists of that day who were really popular, who were doing what we think of as traditional Chicano art that kind of resembles a lot of the uh, Mexican muralist like masters. Um, they were not open to supporting graffiti, and they would just encourage us to take our skills and and, um, and apply them in a different direction. And I'm personally, I'm not Chicana, but I grew up in the Chicano community in Los Angeles, and so I worked with a lot of Chicanos, and we would definitely get, you know, there's there's definitely a small group of muralists from the older generation who have always supported artists coming out of like the street culture and the majority have not. And I've had this conversation with people that I've worked for doing restorations and they ask like, what's wrong with your, the younger generations and why are they so disrespectful and why are they, you know, why do they tag the murals? And it's because there's a lack of continuity. Like these muralists left LA for the most part to get opportunities because there was not a lot of opportunities for them here, which I understand, but they didn't come back or like keep a bridge until much later, till we had already, till the scene had already been established really by the groundwork of people like Man and Chaz. And so by the time that, um, my, that myself and my media peers got to a level where we started producing productions and doing full scale murals without even realizing that we were doing full scale murals. Like we just got together, like let's all paint this wall together. We'll paint the whole wall. We'll have a unified theme in the background and all our names. And that was kind of like the way we, learned how to scale and do everything in terms of muralism. And, and what really brought a lot of us together is that immediately in that time, like in the, the turn of the century, basically, there was a ban against murals. And any mural, no matter how awesome it was that was made with spray paint, was going to get like whitewashed by the city. And so one of my murals that I have on here, it's like an Egyptian mural that was in the slideshow. It actually is, was deleted by the city. It was whitewashed by the city illegally. And um, 
And so what happened is that this was like an epidemic. And so all these artists were like, yeah, I'm not even doing vandalism anymore. I'm about to go and like see what's up and try to fight for my rights. And people like, man. And um, but another guy whose name is Stosh put a lot of effort into gathering the graffiti community to come and like basically protect our work. And when we went down and we ended up finally at you know the DCA and at City Hall to do that, we ran into all these muralists who we've been looking at their work our, our whole lives. Like, you know, there's muralists like, like Noni Olavisi. I saw her work on Jefferson like so much throughout my life. And I just used to pass by this mural of like, it's like a revolutionary mural with the Black Panthers and the KKK and Harriet Tubman. And, um, and I used to say like, one day I'm gonna paint a mural like that. One day I'm gonna paint a mural like that. And then I got the opportunity later to actually paint with Noni, you know, through this kind of activism when we started to like go and just say, hey, you know, we, ha we had permission for this. Why did you whitewash our wall? Like, and they would say it was gang related or say it was illegal signage and all these nonsense excuses. But ultimately it politicized us and it brought us together. And we were able to overcome that and we were able to actually, you know, get um, new regulations, new legislation that doesn't have those kind of restrictions against lettering and things like that, that are clearly targeting like LA street culture, you know, which is often associated with gang culture, like um, incorrectly. You know, you know, one of the things about uh, graffiti um, is that even though we talk about, um, I consider myself also Chicano and Latino artist, um, is one of the beautiful things about being a graffiti artist, I remember, especially early on, was there was no real color lines. I mean, I had friends who were doing graffiti who were black, who were Asian, um, who were girls, who were guys. It didn't matter. Um, we were always out there kind of doing it together. And that's kind of what held us uh, together on the streets. Um, but yeah, I want to pose a question to the younger guys on the panel, um, because I know how it was when I was coming up. But when you guys were coming up, what was this? Was there a, that same sense of camaraderie that we had when we were younger, or did would that get lost in the transition? Or tell us a little bit about about that. Uh, yeah, uh, I don't think it shifted much. Um, that competitiveness was still there. Uh, the drive, maybe a little bit. I think uh, the laws started to get tighter. Um, there were certain things that were happening in the early 90s that I don't think happened in it. The, like right now, there, that it just wouldn't happen or else the fines and, and the, the penalties would just be extreme. The jail time. Yeah, there's just so many things that I think that the youth, they might not necessarily be pushed to take those risks anymore. But that's also looking at it, the criminal aspect of it, and I think that's where the lines get blurry because a lot of times it is that criminal aspect of the art that seems to be always like like hound and and when you really dig down deep it's beyond that and it the destruction was already there and the core of what's happening is to uplift culturally everyone out up out of that destruction and visually seeing that destruction because at the end of the day i mean we didn't, like a lot of these neighborhoods where the graffiti was really like raging, it wasn't necessarily like the prettiest block, you know, or, or you know, there's a like, if you really go around town, like a lot of these liquor stores have like artwork on them. They have like graffiti pieces. Why? I mean, it's a liquor store. Like, like you don't want to just see advertisements of liquor every day. Like, so a lot of us guys were like, hey, like, let's paint that wall. Let's do something else different with it. And maybe just maybe, if we get along with the gangs, cool. Or maybe, you know, we just won't have any interaction of, that promotes the violence. But a lot of times, you know, when you read into it, you also see that there's a story. You know, like I got buddies that, you know, they're not from here. But I remember years back, they were like, they knew where they were at because they started to see that the tags were changing. So like, the, like every time they would hit a corner, like the tags would become more blocky. You know, it went from like wild style to like these blocky gang letters. And so then they started to figure out like, oh shoot, like I don't think we're in the right neighborhood. Like Ace, like, yo man, like <laughs> this ain't looking too good. <laughs> I think we went the wrong way. So, so, it, it, so like me growing up, like my own personal, you know, I, I have my own personal things that I had to deal with growing up. 
And it just ha you know, it just so happened that graffiti played a positive role in that. Um, there's always, you know, a, a, a positive to a negative and a negative to a positive. So like those things exist, but for the most part, I mean, th there was a certain, a certain drive. There's a certain energy that I think that, like, I could feel it. Like, let's see, uh, let's say, like, I got into high school like around 2000, 1989, 2000. I could still feel all that energy surging from 1990 in 2000. Like, growing up, like, I could look at the art, I could see it, I could look at the history, I could talk to people in the street, I got family, like, I could feel all that energy that came out of the 90s like it's still there so like for me and like the people in my generation i think that we we owe we owe a debt to all those people who came out of that like the the, the surgeons of that like who emerged and made it popular you know possible to actually be able to even like pick up a spray can or even have the idea of even like hey like maybe i can do something with with this art maybe i could take it places you know, because other people open the doors. And so by the time it all hit me, it's it's just a matter of like, man, like what's here can't die out. So how can I keep that alive? And then at the same time, sort of, um, what do you call that? Sort of uh, transform, like, you know, create art that's purposeful and it's transformative at the same time because also the culture and, and the way that we define art is kind of shifting. Yeah, I think, um, I guess I, I came up doing graffiti in the mid to late 90s. And so I saw this big shift, especially like Chaz was talking about with the Zero One Gallery. I remember those shows on Melrose. Those were what influenced me to go from the streets and just doing illegal graffiti to sitting inside and working on a painting and taking that painting and elaborating on, elaborating on it and doing a mural and trying to push my craft a little bit farther. Um, so seeing these type of murals or like, man, I would take the bus every day from, from high school on Cesar Chavez and see your mural. And I was like that, before I even met you, that was something that, that inspired me to want to wanna paint something larger. And, and seeing the shift in graffiti going from just the streets and illegal onto to murals, liquor stores, and then in the galleries, that was something that uh, drew me into it even more and more and kind of pushed me and, and, and made me really passionate about uh, what, was, what was to come. And then now, you know, 15 years later, you see where it is, it's mainstream. It's before back then, 99, 98, you could tell someone you were a graffiti artist and you'd be looked down on. Now you tell someone you're a graffiti artist and what you do and there's people that come up to you and they want you to sign their book or they want to see your work and, and purchase your work. It's a really interesting shift yeah. that's happened. And, and I, I know there's negatives and positives to that, but um, I think without, without that shift, I wouldn't be able to have this as a career. And I never thought that this would be a career or something I could make money off. I never wanted it to be that. I just was having fun and it was something I was very passionate about. And uh, it kind of grew from there. But because of the groundwork that these gentlemen laid, I'm able to make a living off this and, and do what I love. And I think that's a really beautiful thing. Did you consider yourself an artist before you got into graffiti? Um, you know, I would just, I didn't consider myself an artist, no. Yeah. Because I got into graffiti by taking the bus every day for an hour and a half from a school in East LA back to the Northeast. And first it was just scribing on the window. So I would just sit there and I'd scratch my name in the, in the window. And then one day I ran across a, a guy that was like, you know, maybe you should try and do something a little bit more elaborate. And uh, he was like, you want to go, let's go down in the river and let's try and do something. Uh, his name was Turn. And we went in the river the next week and he showed me how to do a piece. He did 90% of the piece at the time for me, but that had me hooked. It was every other day I was ditching school, going in the river, painting, painting. And that kind of grew grew from there that was it was like the beginning of an addiction yeah to, i mean not, not to rat you out or anything like that but this guy used to do some massive massive <laughs> roller pieces right like in the other river i'm talking huge huge pieces and when i first started seeing your work um obviously it was in your face and you couldn't avoid it but to tell me years later you're gonna be doing stuff like this like i had no idea you know 
Um, and I think that's part of the beauty about graffiti that I love and I think that we're all sharing here. But, um, you know, when did you make that transition from just, like, bombing, doing big, big pieces to, like, you know what, there's a fine art twist to it? I mean, was it intentional or did you just kind of fall into it? Um, there was a few things that came into play um, with that. At that time, um, I loved doing those pieces. One thing was the, the river got washed. They, they painted over every single piece of graffiti in the river. Um, the second thing was I was kind of fed up with the politics of graffiti and uh, who I could paint with, and I had to paint with my crew, but I couldn't paint with these other people, even though they were my friends. So I kind of started to separate myself from that. Um, and the third thing was I, I hit up a, a guy who was a building owner down the street from my house like, and asked, could I do a mural on, um, on your wall? And he was like, yeah, yeah, I'd love that. Come, come in. I'm an artist, too. And he, and he let me in his studio, and he had a show that was about to be shipped to New York. And his name is Steve Houston. He's a figurative painter. And he had about 20 large-scale oil paintings of boxers just all laid, uh, laid around uh, his studio waiting to be shipped. And immediately when I walked in, I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to do something just that detailed with that impact. Um, and from then on, I traded the mural for his art lessons. And he, he just schooled me in figurative work. Um, so that kind of separated me from graffiti for a while because I really dug into that. And that was kind of the transition into the more artistic mural side from the graffiti illegal aspect. One of the things that I'm really inspired by is the fact that you um, are a really multidisciplinary artist. Um, you know, you went to school, you studied. Um, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, would you say the majority of graffiti artists out there are multidisciplinary or, do, you know, are they sort of like just have a few tools in their toolbox or, I mean, like, is it... Are you the exception or, or, the, or the rule? No, I think it, it really it runs the gamut between all artists. It really depends on how... I, I think at one point I realized to make a living doing art, I need to know how to do graphic design. I need to know how to, to paint with oils, paint with acrylics, paint with watercolor, um, be able to work in any medium, any style, especially doing stuff in the movie studios. They, they kind of expect you to know all these different things. So we're looking at an amazing um, production of yours right there. Talk, talk to us about that. What, what are we seeing right here? Uh, so this is a, a high school in Huntington Beach, um, Edison, and they approached me to do a, a mural. With They, they like the classical kind of artwork that I do. Um, and I told them what I needed. I needed it to be primed, painted over, and then the paint. And I said, I can't have any restrictions on what I do. I, you got to just let me go. The only restriction they did give me and I was okay with was with the color. Because, of course, it has to be school colors. Um, but, and then, uh, so I just ran with it. It took me about three weeks on and off. It was, you know, about an hour away because it's a far drive down there. And it actually says my name throughout the whole whole <laughs> building which none of them know subliminal <laughs> subliminal subliminal so okay so but break this down and unpack it for us a little bit i mean how many hours do you think or days or weeks did it take you i think you said maybe three weeks or something but 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 what was the process and um the inspiration behind it um so this was it's a wrestling gym for for the edison high school team and they just wanted something powerful and I thought these kind of were powerful, iconic images. Um, you know, the Greek gods and the wrestling and these sculptures and the way they're lit. It's, it just has some kind of essence. And with the kids underneath where they wrestle, yeah. it, um, it's kind of, you know, intimidating to have these big gods looking down on you, making you small. Um, but then it also gives them power, I think. So, are we, I mean, do you remember about how many square feet uh, this, this is? Is this... You know, I think each wall was about 75. Uh, the, the long walls are 75, and the back wall is about 45 or 50. And it's 35 feet tall, I believe. So you're bringing in, what, scissor lifts or cherry pickers? Or yeah, what, we had a scissors? huge scissor lift that probably shouldn't have been on that wood floor because every time I drove it, it would crackle. And I kind of <laughs> got worried that it was going to go down one day. Well, I mean, that's awesome. Um, you know, I have a question for Pedal. Um, people always, every time I do graffiti events or anything else, they're always like, 
how come there's no women graffiti artists? How come there's no women graffiti artists? And I always have to give them my mansplaining on it. So man one splaining. Yeah, man, man one splaining. Yeah. Uh, well, I I would rather you tell them because no, you're. But I just, I'm just curious. What do you tell them? Well, I usually tell them. You know, in LA, graffiti. You know, especially when I was coming up, it, it was it was really rough, and a lot of girls don't want to be running around in the middle of the night. Um, you know, just because of the dangers of LA. Um, and most of the girls that I knew that did graffiti, were pretty tough, you know? And, um, you know, that's changed over the years, I think because of street art and everything, making it more acceptable. But um, in other cities, I saw more, more women in graffiti. Like in Europe, I didn't see, I saw a lot of women doing graffiti in Europe because I don't think they felt like to me that at night they felt a little safer than in LA. But, you know, that's just my, Take well, coming up, I would say that women, female graffiti artists were less than like 0.01%. There was like, le there was more than a thousand guys doing graffiti for every girl that was doing graffiti, for sure. Um, and a lot of it is because it's a rough sport and it's dirty and it's outside in grimy places and, you know, nighttime. And so um, I think that, you know, that is a big deterrent. It's also cultural, you know? It's like there's a lot of kind of patriarchal cultures in Los Angeles and, you know, Latino culture being one of them, Middle Eastern culture, Asian culture, um, white American culture, black American culture. They're all pretty much patriarchal. Yeah, so. what culture is it? <laughs> so Messed I think up. that girls are less likely to, um, to like, really overcome the initial challenges of doing graffiti successfully, like actually going out and getting up. I think that for LA, you know, the bus graffiti movement was so huge. And so everybody took the bus, boys and girls. So during that time, there was a lot of female graffiti. There was a lot of female taggers. But um, I think that, you know, right now around the world, there's an explosion of female graffiti artists and it's really amazing. And a lot of them are, there's like, it's kind of strange because in LA or for us, most of us started tagging and doing graffiti and then got good at it. And that's how we became artists. Like we did not become, we were not artists that started to then do graffiti. But because of the evolution of graffiti, there's now a lot of people who are um, entering into the graffiti art genre um, after coming out of art school and things like that. And they're, they really like the medium of spray paint. And, you know, there's like every day I get in my Google alerts for like female graffiti artists, some kind of women empowerment mural or team or artists somewhere. Yesterday, I think it was from Turkey. It's like all over the world. It's exploding. And, um, and that's because the definition of graffiti is different in different places. And one of the main things I think that a lot of us focus on is that like when kind of making the distinction between graffiti and street art is that graffiti artists like learn how to do art from doing graffiti. It's not like a method of putting our work up that we choose to use, you know? So um, that's really for me what makes somebody a graffiti, art a graffiti artist. And right now there are a lot more women and I think that's because, you know, if you can just open the door for a few women or it's just like opening the door for any other group that's been kind of um, like, pushed out of something or not let in, then the floodgates open. And, you know, once one girl sees a female graffiti artist, then she knows she can be one too. That's how it was for me. I saw Lady Pink, I saw Omega, Chalk, and then Blossom, who would eventually give me my name. So it's like, um, I mean, it, it was a lot different back then. It was a lot different up until I would say even the last 10 years that there was a lot fewer females involved. And especially with the street culture aspect. But, um, it just, I think there's like, I think a lot of people do graffiti and just a very small per percentage stick with it. And so um, now you see like a huge difference because women are just becoming more empowered in general. And, and girls, you know, from the younger generations, they don't have the same, um, like, they don't have the same factors, like, and the same level of patriarchy kind of, directing them. There's like huge explosions of feminism happening all over. So I think that that encourages girls to get out and express themselves. And a lot of people see graffiti as like, kind of like, not even so much as being culturally defiant, but like just really um, 
seeing it as a way to magnify their voice. And I think that that's what we've all, where we all come from. Like graffiti in its essence is the voice of the voiceless. And illegal graffiti is what we do in order to learn how to do, um, you know, elaborate artwork. It's like, a, it's like almost like a school, you know? And, and when it comes to vandalism, like, you know, I think that people's opinions on vandalism should really be more like well thought out because when you talk about public property, like when you talk about private property, there's no question about whether vandalism is somebody going and vandalizing another person's property. When it comes to public property, especially dilapidated public property like the LA River, like, come on, this is not the same level of vandalism. And also there's like, we all pay taxes, even if we just pay sales tax. So it's like, who gets to say whether the LA River, you know, like it was such a waste of money to buff the LA River. We weren't hurting anybody going in there learning how to paint. We all like learned how to paint in there. And now kids will go to jail if they're painting in there. It's ridiculous. Well, I have an idea for, for the LA River. All right, well, I'm with it. <laughs> yeah, I, I told someone that we should uh, paint the LA River for the Olympics, the LA 28 oh. Olympics. But we don't want to paint Olympic murals. No, we want to paint our murals <laughs> on the LA River, all whatever, 60 miles of it or whatever it is. Right, that would be um, People laughed, but you guys heard okay. it here. It'll you guys happen. petition, and we'll paint it, and we'll get other friends to paint it. But, um, <clears throat> you know, I think, did you have a question? No, I was just going to say I didn't laugh. Oh, <laughs> yeah. That's why you're my partner. You made that happen once. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, actually, we, I, yeah. Again. And, and got buffed. Um, we, we won't talk about that today. Um, I have a question for Chaz. Um, you know, a, a, lot of, a lot of the younger generation, um, when they talk about uh, being an artist and making a living, um, yeah. they, they really don't know where to go or what to do. And, um, you know, you're from the older generation, but I see you on social media. <laughs> I see your website. I see your Instagram. I see all this stuff you're doing. And it's not slowing you down. It's actually, like, catapulting you, I think. Um, what, what advice do you have for, like, younger artists who... who get stuck in like promoting themselves or what they want to do and you know it's like it's their generation that you know they were born with a computer not us yeah uh, uh i remember is uh um uh, right, right in the 90s when i met you guys and all that i used to go up to the city hall and he said he said ask me about about the youth what was i doing to protect the youth i was going to put you in jail by encourage you uh to doing graffiti and and everything else and I, and I kept on saying, I go, no, the best way to get the youth uh, out, uh, to get the crime out of the graffiti thing is, I kept on telling you guys, do more graffiti. <laughs> uh, you know, which means that you get more involved. Your skills get better. You know, but you start uh, talking in, uh, in uh, to people from New York. When the computer came in, on your, on your account, on, on, on your time, because it was your generation who brought it in, I remember Mir was saying he's, he got a website and described it to me. And it was like the early 90s or something like that. He goes, yeah, you, but you need one. It didn't make any sense for me. I said, no, you need to do the, the work first. Eventually, is, uh, the social media turned into what we had to do. We were young. We had to go to New York. Because in New York, you had to get a review from an art magazine. If you got a review from an art magazine, then you would get into a good gallery. And that only happened in New York. L.A. was a backwash. You could, plenty of uh, artists here in the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, but you could get no recognition, no uh, traction. So you had to go back east. And then what I, what I noticed is that uh, with the youth is that, let's see, how did it happen? I started getting my website, and after right now is I'm on uh, social media. Finally learned what a boomerang was, you know, so, so we got that. I don't do it. I get young people to do it for me, you know. And if you're not on social media, you, which you don't exist. So, I mean, and, and I realize if you got a, a photo of a picture of me just hitting a tag, I might get uh, one, two, three, four thousand hits. If that same video was just me moving it, I'll get five to 8,000 hits. It's kind of like it's what the audience really wants to see and be engaged in it. They want to be also be graffiti writers without having to leave their living room, you know. Uh, it takes work to be a graffiti writer. 
It takes physical work. It takes hand skills. It takes going out there, climbing ladders and all that, uh, getting dirty. Uh, you know, it, it takes a hustle to, to be the writer. But to get exposed, we were in Rome, uh, the modern uh, Roman modern art museum. I was there with the street art, which I'm not real, really don't care for that word. I like graffiti because as, as a form of art form where you have to fight for it, where you have to defend. I like the word graffiti. Street art is great. It's what opened up an awful opportunity for me. And but I'm I was telling these guys I'm going up against uh, 20 year olds, and I'm just turning. I'm going to be turning uh, 70. So I'm 50 years older than these young bloods who are going, we're going both up in ladders and all that. They keep me young. I enjoy doing graffiti. I love to paint on the streets, you know. Most of my work is in the studios, but it's kind of like once you're hooked, you never give it up. And then now I am collected by uh, MoCA and LACMA and three of the uh, museums of the Smithsonian. And, um, and a bunch of other museums throughout the United States. But that doesn't really, that just kind of big talk sounds great because museums don't do anything for you. It's kind of like I get a kick when I see a young kid going down the, the street on one of my decks designing and wearing, wearing one of my t-shirts. That's my paycheck. I get excited about that, you know. Culture is fine art now. That's what we are. We are ambassadors of culture. We, we create what, what the world is about, you know. What is, what's an artist? We're, like, we're special people. We're the image makers. Who else can take your abstract thought of past loves, of memories gone by, of the future, uh, you know, abstract, like I say, abstract thought or something that you read or something that you see on TV, get all that imagery and dialogue and get it all into one piece of paper and, and organize it? That's what we do. We create art. We create our culture. And, you know, and I think you've got some really good people up here. Chaz, you uh, touched on something that I'd like for you to uh, expand on and have, have the whole panel talk about it as well. You touched on the difference between graffiti and street art. And if I understood what you were saying, you, you, you were saying the principal difference between the two is the struggle that, uh, that you have with graffiti art versus street art. Could you talk a little bit more about the difference between graffiti and street art? And I'd like to have the panel explain, uh, talk about that as well. That difference is, is my own personal opinion because uh, street art is turned into graffiti. Some of the most fantastic, most beautiful pieces are done by street artists. Uh, and now everybody's good. You pick up a book, everybody is good in the world. Uh, like I said, we were invited to Tokyo, Rome, uh, 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 Australia. Let's see, I got a piece, I got to finish up for November for Australia, uh, New Zealand. Uh, you know, like I say, Italy, Spain, we go all over. They invite us. They pay for everything and all that. It's because the street artists and the street uh, festivals, you know, before it, the, the art, to be an artist had to be in a gallery. Now you, you're competing against walls in cities. You know, you, you're going about blocks and blocks of artists. And, and I'm meeting artists from all over the world, from South America, from Japan, all at the same time, and a lot of young women. The Japanese women are killing it over there, you know, insane. So I'm not here to complain about the street art. They uh, offer me a new opportunity. It's just in my sense, I like that struggle. I like that, like I say, I like cholo graffiti. You know, we should scream blood in, blood out. You know? Right. <laughs> um. I always, you know, my main thing with like the difference between street art and graffiti is really like, did you, like graffiti artists, like I said, learned how to do art from tagging and, and from like going through the process of making graffiti, from tagging to the bubble letters, to the pieces, to the whole productions and everything. And so it's a different, like, it's really a different type of training. Um, I, I just have a problem with the term street art because it's like an academic kind of re, like it's like a redefinition de of graffiti or like, you know, a new label basically. And I've heard these ridiculous people that like have no knowledge of the history of graffiti, especially in Los Angeles, talking about terms like post graffiti and being in a street art era and talking about how street art, like, you know, how women weren't allowed to do graffiti because there's some kind of like graffiti organization that makes rules or something. And that um, 
that men, you know, that street art basically opened the door for women to do, to do graffiti, which is like a huge insult to female graffiti artists who like, you know, went through the whole struggles to, to fight sexism in graffiti. Um, so yeah, I think that, you know, it's just like an academic convoluted term that's created by like art school hype. And I'm not into any of like, I'm not into art school, academia, um, languaging surrounding art, especially when it comes to graffiti because um, graffiti is a secret language, it's a hidden world, and it's only now kind of in the last decade kind of been telling, like, been telling its own story in Los Angeles. And so I don't like it when people from outside the culture come in and try to tell this like whole history and paint this picture because it's, they, don't, they don't know it. And it actually takes a lot of different graffiti artists and crews and people from all over the city to tell their own stories in, able, in, in order to really develop the full story because LA is such an expansive landscape and we have so many different cultural communities and socioeconomic communities. Um, so yeah, to me, street art is kind of like a pro cultural appropriation, the term itself. And I just don't understand why people don't call themselves muralists or like a public artist. It's like, what makes you a street artist? You know, because there's a word for that already when you paint walls. And so I just think that, you know, it's like kind of trendy of a term and I don't particularly use it. In my career, I have asked people to not refer to me that way, but I've kind of had to ease up on it, especially in an international setting because it's totally, you know, graffiti is different in different places. Graffiti in LA is different than graffiti in New York. Like we deal with the stigma of gang banging and racism and we have these like um, kind of violent um, type of like, this idea of violence projected on us when we were actually trying to like go a different direction. And so, yeah, I think that in LA, it's particularly sensitive, especially with the explosion of gentrification street art. But yeah, I could go on about that. For well, I, I, <laughs> th panel. I think to me, one of the differences about graffiti and street art and being a graffiti artist my whole life was that it was based on lettering. And that's, that's definitely, kind of, that's definitely. kind of, you know, what it was about. Yeah. Right? That's the beginning of it. Like, that, we learned scaling, we learned everything from doing right. letter. So it was, the letter was a subject matter, and then that drove forward. And which leads me to ask Ace, you're doing this kind of work now. Um, what the hell? How did it get there? <laughs> How did it go from your lettering to like this, you know? Um, and because I still consider yourself, I still consider you, you know, a graffiti artist, I still mm -hmm. consider you an artist, whatever. But you know, the stuff you're doing now, you want to explain a little bit about this, the style you're working in? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, just thinking about the whole street art graffiti thing, you know, when there, I guess somewhere in the, these early 2000s somewhere, I guess when I was getting out of high school, when I, I don't know, when I was getting out of high school, I was kind of like going back and forth in my mind. It, do I even want to pursue art in general? You know, like, like, you know, you asked a question earlier about, you know, did you consider yourself an artist first? And I thought that that's how I used to think until, you know, I, I saw a classmate one day, you know, doing some, some piecing on a black book. And I was like, what is that? And then I got hooked into that lifestyle. But moving into this, um, I think it was me typing back into the artist side and starting to see this whole surgence of street art and knowing what the essence of graffiti really was for me and this street art was sort of like not it wasn't really like the label that i looked up to like i did that wasn't the label that i wanted to run with so for me i needed the process beyond those labels and where was i going to go personally and looking at some of the guys that i looked up to chaz being one of them you know how do you just be you and go beyond everything and not just sort of get caught up in these labels because from what I see, you know, I felt like there was like a, a trend. Um, something's trendy and everyone wanted to hop on this trend. And when I looked at a lot of street art, just like street art over the course of history, it seemed like for me, it all re had some relationship to propaganda. And I had to ask myself, well, do I want to go down the lane of dealing with propaganda? Like, I don't know if, you know, and to do things that are 
based on propaganda is also to be looking at political issues and relating those things back into the artwork. And I don't know if I want to, want to spend my day doing that because I think that right now we're in a time where people need a peace of mind. They need to see something that has a relevance to nature and the, the, the original order of life and how nature works outside of all these propaganda, like imagery. So I didn't want to get involved with that. And so um, I was always into uh, the, the fine art stuff, the more like, you know, Rembrandt, um, the Baroque period, seeing a lot of Art Nouveau, uh, Alfonso Mucha. I was really attracted to a lot of those guys. And um, over the time, uh, I started to find out that some of the writers that I looked up to, you know, who also considered themselves artists outside of graffiti, they were also attracted to these these same uh, classical art arts. And I sort of said to myself, you know, I think I want to think outside the box and go down that lane because, I mean, when you're running up and down the block and all day and you're working with spray paint, it's a little different. You don't, you know, you forget about there's the brush. You know, you could just simply pick up a brush and start painting. And of course, that's what I did. I just picked up the brush and said, you know what, I'm going to go back to this level of, of art. You know, and having conversations with you, Chaz, I think that also helped speed, speed that kind of thought along for me because there was a lot of history I was learning about outside of graffiti. And I felt like I needed to start to implement that, um, not just for myself, but also future artists. And thinking about not just graffiti, but what it meant for me in the black diaspora and looking at it in other cultural diasporas and how does all of the, how, how can my work be reflective of all the cultures in a sense? Because, you know, I think in my neighborhood, it's sort of, uh, for a lot of, a lot of people, it's sort of like everything comes from Africa. Africa is the birthplace of everything. Everything spawns out of there. So there's all, there's that, that struggle that's already there that I think that I've trained myself to see beyond because I'm sort of, for my people, a lot of it is this feeling of being born into that. Like you're born into this struggle. Like this is the, the, this is the curtain that's pulled over you that, that uh, uh, keeps you from seeing a broader picture. And so for me, it's being able to paint a broader picture, look into the psyche and give the psyche something to meditate on outside of what is currently like being pushed on society. And I think that, you know, overall, like I just locked myself in the, you know, in the studio one day and said, you know, let me start kicking out work and, and start running in circles, you know, instead of running in circles, let me start painting these circles. <laughs> so a uh, question though. Can I chime in on that real quick? Oh yeah, of course. Um, just to, to speak to what you were saying, I think that at a certain point, a lot of us, um, when, when our work evolves to a level that we're actually impressed with, we experience this like healing kind of like therapeutic enlightening feeling. And then we want to share that with everybody, but not in a way that it's like, oh, here I have this healing thing. It's like, we just want to share the energy, but it really becomes this like cu cultural, social community process of like trying to like spread this this positive energy, especially when you're painting murals, because you're putting that out into the world. And so, you know, I think a lot of us started from a place of extreme anger, and then we're able to, to go work through that. And now we're here. So we're like, oh, my God. And now like, we're here with these crazy opportunities to talk to people at the public library. Like, we probably tagged in the bathroom of this library, like all and of us, you know, like, the, as kids. Like, for the most part, um, like a lot of the work you see here that I've done, I mean, there is a deeper, deeper, much deeper explanation to it. But I mean, I could definitely go on and on about it. Um, to sort of kind of tell you what I mean by that, um, the circles, they kind of act as a oculus. So uh, when you think about a cathedral, there's a dome inside of a cathedral. And sometimes you go and you look up at the dome. That's sort of how these mandalas work. You know, they work like portals, but they're also to kind of open up this, this new paradigm within space and time is if you are actually inside some sort of cathedral and you can look up into the heavens. So there's, there's that notion in my head. So when I paint these things, I kind of have all these 
ideas running through my, my mind. Well, I mean, uh, okay, it was the music, it felt like the, you know, the Oscars when the music starts going, like, you're almost out of time. <laughs> we still have time, right? There's no war. We still have time. Uh, was that a parade going by? What was uh, that exactly? I don't know. It was cool. Um, you know, one of the things I wanted to ask was just, um, um, you know, every, everyone here has had their own journey, either gone to school, not gone to school, you know, done whatever they've done. Um, but now we're all here ne sitting next to each other and there's a huge art movement that we're all part of in one way or another. Um, so looking into the future, like what do you think is going to happen to this movement? What do you think is going to be your role in it? Or, you know, just what do you think about where you're going to be at in, in the future? You know, whether it's a year from now or, or 10 years from now, you know, whatever. Um, I mean, Maybe talk about a little bit about what the future can be for, for your art. Anyone who wants to start? I'll start it. I, I think there's great opportunity for all of us, you know, like uh, in three weeks we're off to China and all that to, dis to a mural and then design a toy and stuff. Uh, that opportunity is offered to a lot, a lot of people that never was there is, is, is before. I think, uh, the Beyond the Street show that was recently here in, in LA, uh, that's moving over to New York in March. First time uh, New York has ever had a major graffiti art show because they hate graffiti in New York. We've been trying to have a graffiti show over there and the city council over there will pull funding out of a museum if they, if they offer the graffiti show. So they, New York was, even though Mecca in a lot of ways, it started. And let me tell you, they only paint uh, during the summer. They don't paint in the winter. <laughs> We're over here in the West Coast. We paint 12 months out of the year. I remember a long time ago, early 90s, we were having these meetings. And I was telling the graffiti, young graffiti guys, I said, you know, we'll never beat New York. They have the history. They got the bubble letters. They got all that, you know. I go, we'll never beat them on their own history and all that. But we could beat them by being better painters. And we could be better artists. And I think L.A. kicks ass over most any other artist in the world, you know. We're not only creative, but we're also inventive and we're out there, you know, it's, it's pushing our scene all over the world. Uh, so I see this blowing up in my personal thing. I can't go up on walls anymore, uh, losing strength in my hand and everything else. And now getting old, you know, eyes are bad. But painting is where I'm is my next uh, journey. I'm gonna be opening up those, more of those museums and all that. And then, you know, it's, uh, who's my collectors? Surprisingly, it's the 1% of the 1%. It's the bling generation are, are who validate me, you know? So what's happening now is, uh, yeah, they put money in my pocket, you know, but so, so I do wanna say about graffiti, real graffiti will always be in the streets, mm -hmm. you know, or street art, whatever we wanna call it happens in the streets. But if you want to talk about its intent, its purpose, its history, its sort of involvement and all that, you know, you, you bring it into the walls or you bring it into the magazine pages. That's where we get our dialogue. That's where we're always writing about it and everything. You, that's where we start getting um, languaging definitions. That's why we need words mm -hmm. to, to, because when I speak about graffiti, I need words to, to describe it of what we're really doing. So graffiti has become very academic. Uh, I've written a lot, helped a lot of theses for uh, master's programs, you know, mm -hmm. uh, but, uh, out there. So it's gonna grow and grow. It's gonna be more about fine art. I think there's gonna be more of a career where we all gonna be making more money and all that. I remember you said about an artist, we never called ourselves an artist. You know, it was too high of a definition unless you were actually making money, you had a career in it, you were actually making, then you call yourself an artist, you know. We were writers, you know. I'm a tagger, mm -hmm. basically. I didn't do productions. I'm tagging to paintings, to, Those to galleries. Kind of productions. You're, the roll calls, they were kind of like early productions. Oh, like. that's a tag of all of us. It oh, was just at the party but painting. It's the, the, but the <laughs> composition, you know, you, you didn't yeah. realize the composition and all that. It was I there. went to art school. I went to Chouinard Art Institute for three years and all that. I was a ceramics major, you know, so, but there was no career in that. And then when Chouinard went out to the Cal Arts, I had to reapply. And they said, your drawing skills suck. 
So they kicked me out, you know. <laughs> so uh, that made me go back. At the same time, I was doing graffiti in the streets. And during the day, I was painting uh, naked people, you know. So I, I, did, I didn't even combine that graffiti for me in the ni early 70s. I didn't consider it fine art. I kept it separate. I did not do my first fine art painting until 1980, where I felt I could bring my graffiti of 10 years into my art school and created my first painting and all that. That was 1980, and it was that roll call. Oh, wow. And then it got picked up by the Smithsonian in their permanent collection. And then that was in 93, when I turned 40, uh, and, uh, 90, uh, 92. When I turned 43, is my favorite number. My life changed, you know. And, and then the Chicana started talking to me, <laughs> you know, after I was in the museums. So <laughs> there is a future out there for all of us, I think, as artists. But like I said, everybody's good now. Only the best are going to survive, you know, which I look forward to it. I intend to be around, mm -hmm. you know. I'm going to kick some butt. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, for me, there's definitely been, you know, in, in the last few years since we did the whole struggle of like the mural ordinance and trying to have legit ways to make our art. Now, you know, there's always the funding, the challenge of finding funding to do major projects. And there's all kinds of funding for art available, but it's really difficult for graffiti artists, no matter how we like disguise ourselves or color ourselves to actually get access to, to major funding. And so, um, I've just been kind of looking and exploring different angles in how people do that outside of public funds and like looking into private um, partnerships. Um, and right now, I'm a teaching artist, so I work with youth, and that's kind of like my main um, mission because of the absence of elders during my like formative years as a young artist and in my formative years of transitioning from doing just illegal graffiti to doing legal murals. I just want to be able to create pathways. And so it's really awesome to work with youth. And I work with a lot of youth that are um, really kind of in the most vulnerable populations. And actually, we were able, we, we took one of my classes over to the Beyond the Streets show, and we ran into Chaz that day. And so all these kids who have looked at his work for years were able to meet him and see him. And I think understanding like the generations of like the, you know, like that this is a pan-generational movement made them see that they do have more opportunities. So for me, um, you know, I agree. I think that graffiti is the dominant art genre in the world right now and that it will continue to be because it's so accessible. And it's just like, you know, anybody who can get a permission for a wall or just find an abandoned wall that nobody cares about, which is like happening all over the world. And, you know, all over the world in different cities, like in Turkey, they were saying that, like, they don't generally mess with the artists when they're just painting abandoned buildings, which, you know, I just read in this one article, but I've heard that in Europe and stuff, it's much easier to just paint abandoned structures than it is here. And um, so, yeah, I just want to kind of continue the work that I've been doing and help to open doors that, you know, have it been opened for me. And, and I think in doing that and in continuing to strengthen our alliance that we'll get access to do like major legacy murals and represent our city because we've had like thousands of murals whitewashed and we really need some like major, like large scale works that are going to last for decades, like the Pope of Broadway style, at least, you know, like five stories, 10 stories of, you know, all of the different LA graffiti artists who have traveled the world. Like, it's so crazy how so many artists have murals all over the world in like 50 different cities and don't have like a real solid wall in Los Angeles and or downtown LA when there's all these like hipster transplant artists painting these big, huge murals. And because they're like connected already with the building owner. And so that's the thing. It's like working with the city, they always try to keep us away from the building owner. So I'm like, now I'm going to the bid directly. And I'm just trying to like build those, those, um, those bridges because, you know, I got pushed into this anyway. Like my work got buffed, my, my stuff got whitewashed over and over again. And I was forced to fight for my rights. And then here I am. And now I'm like learning, you know, the next steps. And then I call people like man and they, give me advice on you know how to proceed but yeah it's kind of experimental but we do have a big support network and we do have international interests so that's cool 
And um, yeah, I think the youth are the future. I think we're going to have like an explosion in the younger generation of magnificent muralists and really put LA back on the map. Um, so we have about 15 minutes left, I think, and we wanted to open up to, for some questions from the audience, if anyone has any questions. So for any of the panelists, um, or else we can keep talking. We have an extra mic. Yeah. Okay. Um, the question I have is: is I, there's a lot of crossover with murals and and graffiti art, like say Dogtown and the skater culture, and some bands like Suicidal Tendencies and Rage Against the Machine. But for the most part, the graffiti scene didn't seem to, or or for say hip hop being one of the main tenants, but it doesn't. When I think of like the the LA punk scene, especially like the hardcore scene, it didn't. There wasn't really any sort of crossover. It was because graffiti was inner city, while the punk scene, especially the hardcore scene, was like suburban white kids. Um, I would say yes, but actually, there's a lot of crossover. There's a lot more punk rock graffiti writers than people realize. They're just more the hip hop punk rock heads. They're like not as much of the exclusive punk rock. You know, like more like the ska punk rock. Because I know some of my, um, like, my elders or, you know, some of the guys that I came up under were into punk rock, like hardcore, the CBSs, West Coast artists, like a lot of the West Side guys, Hollywood punk rock. But, um, yeah, for the most part, the suburban scenes, like the suburban graffiti writers would have to come into the inner city to really engage the rest of the graffiti scene. So I think that, that that's a big part of it. And also graffiti, as much as it's really diverse, is very like, I like, I think that there's an aspect of the kind of like racism and like kind of Nazi stuff that goes on in the punk scene in, you know, in that part of it that definitely doesn't resonate in the LA graffiti scene. Like it wouldn't have ever, it wouldn't have even got, been able to get past like white boys in the LA graffiti scene. So there's that element of it that makes us like, we're really, even though we're diverse, we're like really anti-racist. Another question? If anybody else has something to ask. Well, you may remember the lawsuit that was made against the city as a try to clarify commercial versus art art. Mm -hmm. And so finally it was resolved. And I thought that would free the way to make it much easier for the artists in this area to get work. So the, the question is, has that really happened? And the second, do you remember the station that used to be on Lucas as it terminated to Beverly and First, where there was a space where artists would always change the graffiti? The Why Belmont the, Tunnel. Belmont Tunnel. Yeah. What? It was called the Belmont Tunnel. Yeah. And so has... Other spaces evolved like that, where artists just come and explore and change and keep going. Yeah, I think so. I think, uh, well, the, the just it's an awkward question, I think, because especially for graffiti writers, Belmont Tunnel was like, I mean, actually, I, like, I miss Belmont Tunnel. Like, I never really had, like, that's out of my generation. But I know enough to tell you that it, like LA in general was the, is the playground, so like you have all these yards, but the yards are the yards, and they're always going to be there, and they're kind of like no one really wants to let you know where this yard is, or because it's their yard. <laughs> but there are places that, like for example, there's Graph Lab, like that, but that's a yard, you know, it's and that's open to a lot of people. They just have maybe two rules, like leave a can, you know, like but do what you want, but they they exist. So Belmont Tunnel was a like a mecca. It was like kind of a headquarters of graffiti. And it was not a legal space, but in a lot of instances, it was like, you know, the cops wouldn't... It was like a really heavy gang-infested um, uh, neighborhood. So the, the cops weren't thinking so much about the taggers. I guess they would only go in to bust the writers when they were bored or not busy or something. So, you know, people would be playing soccer up in there on the weekends and... A lot of people, myself, my generation, we just would go in there and like explore our art skills. You know, we could go there and actually do like an elaborate full colored piece. And 
and just chill out. And it was local, so it was like easy to get to. And it was this awesome historic train station that, you know, was, was that, left over from the. There was that, uh, that Mayan game they used to play there. Right? Oh, yeah, the yeah. pelota. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was like a really awesome community space. And like a lot of other spaces similar to that, abandoned structures that became graffiti yards and were used by the community, it was developed. And now it's like an apartment building. And the tunnel still exists, but it's sealed off. And it was like toxic waste when it was open, so I would not recommend going inside. But, um, but yeah, so in terms of the Belmont Tunnel, there are really not that many spaces left of that, that size because they're, the city's getting developed so much. And in terms of the mural ordinance and the ban you, that you were talking about, um, what happened is the city did have an ordinance that was a mural billboard sign ordinance. And so when they outlawed the big building wraps, then they... Um, then they um, they also outlawed murals with that. And so, and when they outlawed murals by default, because the whole thing got banned, you know, the whole, the whole ordinance was like um, on hold or whatever, the city attorney and the LAPD used that as an excuse to go attacking graffiti cultural murals. And it's like, it was very blatant and rampant. And they would go tell building owners that, you know, this is gang related or it's an illegal sign and we're going to fine you a thousand dollars a day. And people got scared and we're still dealing with that today. We're still dealing with the aftermath of being able to get private walls because people are scared that the police are going to come and do that to them again. Cause this was like in the early 2000, this was from 2002 to 2012. So, you know, we kept painting murals, but a lot of them got buffed. But, but now we do have a mural ordinance where we have a lot less restrictions. We just have to like basically put in an application and there's very little content restriction except for like hate speech and porn and pornography or something. So we have made progress, but it doesn't mean that it's going to be that easy to just get access to the resources and the space. We really have to continue that fight and so um and even though there's a legal um uh, like an open yeah. ordinance now okay. that we can do murals but who's going to pay for our paint who's going to yeah. pay for our time there's still no not enough funding from the city or any other organizations to help us actually paint murals right so uh technically we can do as many murals as we want but you know financially like who's going to sponsor you know these murals cost money you know you need 10 20 30 thousand dollars sometimes to create these murals so that's kind of what's lacking, and that's the next thing that we have to figure out. Hi, hello. Um, I'm a 20-year uh, vet in the graffiti art world. It saved me from joining gangs and, like, uh, you know, a violent lifestyle. And I noticed that you guys are um, at a stage above me where you have more power, more, more of a voice, right? And uh, I'm wondering, what are you doing for the youth, for the kids? Uh, I give them art books and coloring books and all that, and I wanted to to see if you guys can come into like South Central LA and, and help the kids out there, you know? Like they, they don't have fathers or mothers. There's gangs and drugs everywhere. Like what are you doing for the youth, the next generation of artists in the world that can't even afford to buy like coloring books or, or art supplies or like a, a crayons, you know what I mean? Like do you have anything going on for that for our, for our next generation? Well, uh, I mean, I'll answer real quickly in a mic. Just in general, uh, I know each one of us is doing something either directly or indirectly, either consciously or unconsciously dealing with that issue uh, because we all came from that in one way or another. Um, the reason that we're here tonight is because I wrote a children's book. I Sorry, I illustrated a children's book called Chef Roy Choi and the Street Food Remix, which I'll be signing afterwards. But the library, uh, because of that book, brought me in and had we had workshops all throughout the year um, throughout, the li throughout the different uh, branches. And so I did free workshops in Watts, in um, uh, Baldwin Hills, and downtown, all over the city. Um, and that's something that happened just because of me getting involved in doing a book, working with the library, and seeing what's possible. And this is the culmination of that through LA Made. So personally, that's one thing I'm doing. But I always thanked Man because he was the guy who had the gallery. And, uh, and all that, and he, you would complain. He says, "Man, I can't finish my work. I'm always helping so many other people." And you know, uh, 
I helped the youth when I was in my, you know, turn 40s. I helped all the teenagers. That was in the 80s, in, in, in the early 90s. And then I was volunteering for the Chicano for the galleries and, and, and helping me organize with these uh, shows. Uh, there were better people than me. There were a lot of women who helped an awful lot, you know, helping uh, handhold the kids where I kind of knuckled them in, into, uh, in, into doing the right thing. Uh, we're all still helping. What, what I'm going to suggest is that you have to do your job because there's so many other kids. Now that I'm older, my kids are the 40-year-olds. What can I do to help them get into uh, European museums? How can they get themselves enough money to get a mortgage to buy a home and all that stuff? I mean, that's where, you know, that's where the 30-year-olds, you, know, want, want, you know, what's next for them? That's how I help my kids and all that. So each one of us is helping the other generation. I'm sure Ace helps is the, the, even the younger kids. But out there in the streets, there's a lot of crime are that 15 to 25 year olds. They do the most destruction of, of anybody and we all get blamed for it, you know? So we all need to help those little, you know, is the young youth. What you're doing is right. And uh, there'll always be the next generation, you know? Uh, but we're all helping in our own ways, you know? So, I mean, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, we need to help the next generation because who is there going to be? I mean, they're our audience. I, I look at these 15 year olds, I said, I want you to get a good job. When you're 25 years old, you could buy my artwork. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, but it's more than that because I want them to have a safe place to, to do their art. I want them to have a place where they could exhibit and have their voice and all that. So what can I do is make sure I finish my work you know, and open up those doors. That's how I help. Um, well, like I had said earlier, I am a product of the 90s hip hop generation of graffiti. And so one of our major philosophies and the way that I learned everything I know is from the each one teach one kind of philosophy. So we definitely, you know, pass that on. That's how we learn everything. There's no school for graffiti. But um, in addition to that, I actually focus my youth work with that age group of like 14 to 25 that are kind of in, I think, you know, the most crucial times because at the phase of life I'm at, I can really help them out and give them some information about resources and access and, you know, just basic things from community college to community resources to, to get stabilized, to be able to do the work you know, to be able to sit down and do some art and develop your skills beyond just going out and getting up. So for me, um, yeah, I mean, I think the youth are the future and that's, I ha you know, I work with youth on a daily. I, I mentor young people and I just try to keep the cycle going. But I do think that, you know, we all do have a responsibility to do that. Um, at the same time, you know, we're just because we're up here on this panel, like we still struggle for, for resources. So it's like, you know, once the, the more we have, the more we can share. I currently work with the Boyle Heights Arts Conservatory. Um, I've done a lot of work throughout all of South Central, Inglewood to Hollywood to the East Side. But right now I'm in Boyle Heights and we have a lot of great youth programs going on there that are not just necessarily visually art centered. We have like all kinds of different things, but yeah, if you if you have youth, then you you know you can just kind of reach out to us on our Instagrams and see what what um, hookups that we have in the in the area. You know, it's like there's people all over. There's artists all over doing workshops, having black book sessions in their in their studios and stuff, just for local youth to where they could just walk or skate over there. So it's really just about expanding your network so that you know who you can like. How, how you can help the next person, even if they're not right there next to you and you don't have the ability to do that. Do either of you guys want to answer that? Yeah. This will probably be the, uh, just about uh, working, with working with youth and what do you do oh. to work with youth? I think that responsibility, that, yeah, that responsibility for me, I think started a while back. Um, I, I actually work with children um, between the summer and the fall uh, between the ages of 6 and 12 at an art center that's uh, uh, ran by the Department of Cultural Affairs. And um, I just teach them basic drawing and painting. Um, and I've been doing that for about three years. That's probably the most 
more than painting these walls is probably one of the ma major consistent things that I've been doing over the last three or four years. But outside of that, uh, my artwork in general, I, I want there to be something in the artwork that for every future generation, they're able to look at it and take away something from it, you know, that that's going to help them become better people. Um, I'm always looking at my art and seeing what can I do to make sure that, you know, the youth, they are attracted to what I'm doing in a way where it's positive for them. Because, I mean, it's if they don't like what I'm doing in 10 years, then that means my stuff is going to die out. You know, like, for example, like Chaz, I think, you know, he's had an impact on me. And that's from like when I was like high school, middle school. So if I can create that same effect that I know that someone is going to be sitting in, you know, the same position I am one day looking like, oh man, if I had never saw Ace and stuff, then, you know, they would have never had the ability to go to another level. So I think that's how I want to like think, you know, that's how I want to move. I want to make sure that whatever I create, I can, put something in it that's going to help uplift the youth for tomorrow. Um, any pro any projects you have that uh, you want artists to get involved, if you reach out to most artists, they're willing to get involved. I shouldn't speak for everyone. But if you reach out to me, I will. I, I love to. I've, I've worked with Artworks LA, man's worked with Artworks. I get emails still from students who have gone on to go to Art Center and continue their art careers. That And I think that's, it's so much, you get so much satisfaction from that, helping them release like their creative outlet and find that there is a path to that. I just got back from Denver doing a project at an uh, underfunded school where we, uh, we there was, 30 artists that donated murals. It was like Shepard Ferry, Findac, people from all over the world went out there. No one was paid. The people who put it on, the raw project, none of them were paid. It was all to give back to these kids who really didn't have much but a school that looked like a prison. And the, just to see their faces, that was enough. That's enough payment. And some of them coming up to you and saying, I want to be an artist, I want to be an artist. You know, that's, that's what I do this for. Um, and I think that project, they're trying to bring that to Los Angeles next. They've done it in Miami. Um, yeah, no, they, yeah. And if anyone has any contacts in schools or anything like that, please let me know because this is the next place they want to bring that, especially LA schools. You can go to other places and their schools still look a little drab, but LA's are the worst, you know, they are really bad. And they, just some color on the walls can can brighten up a kid's day, make you want to go to school. If I had murals all over my schools when I was younger, I probably wouldn't have ditched so much. You know, I went, I went to the LA River to see that. Um, so bring that to the kids and that might uh, enlighten them a little more and, and have them, you know, follow, the, follow their passion and not just get stuck into something they're not happy doing. Cool. So I think uh, we're running out of time now. Um, you know, I know there's tons of more questions and everything like that, but I just want to, uh, first of all, thank all our panelists for being here today. So please give them a hand.